a really clear way of looking at psychology in this present time is to describe it as being 100% rational. It's rational all the way. It's entirely founded upon rationality and there's nothing in it that isn't rational. No irrational stuff in it whatsoever. And that probably sounds good to a lot of people because if it's rational, <clears throat> that's good. We certainly don't want any irrational bits and pieces in it. So 100% pure old fashioned rationality sounds really, really good to us. Or it um, might sound really, really good to us. If we're not given to looking, in, looking into things at all, if we are given to looking into things, then it doesn't, um, it doesn't sound so good at all, really. So the basic premise, which psychology is based on, both psychology, psychology as a body of theory and psychology as a body of theory that leads on to therapy, It's, it's founded upon rationality. It's founded upon absolutely everything on the idea that absolutely everything in the world is rational. And <clears throat> therefore, that life, whatever you call that thing that happens to us after we get born and stops happening when we die, that this business is um, capable of being navigated by nothing more than logical thought, i.e. you could be pure logical, like Mr. Spock in the very first Star Trek, but that's not logical, Jim. Which was good in that it, it highlighted this idea of being logical and how strange it is, because we don't focus on how strange it is very often, because it is strange, because the actual Truth of the matter is that being a human is comprised of a number of different, different elements. There's the, there's the rationality, there's the intuition, there's the insight, there's kind of fuzzy stuff that isn't so well defined as rationality, but we know we've got it because if we met someone who was 100% rational, in other words, if you met a robot, I suppose, we'd know it. Even though that's a kind of an issue in itself, isn't it? How do you tell when a, um, a very advanced android pretends to be human? Well, I'd say the reason you could tell is because there's elements missing. It's like someone who is um, unfortunate enough to be a total psychopath trying to say non-psychopathic things in company, just throwing them in. Do you know the way that you would throw in a comment into the general conversation to be part of the conversation and to show that you know what's going on, which is hard if you haven't got that particular point of view where you can take on other people's um, experiences or lives as being meaningful. It's a very hard thing to do. <clears throat> but no doubt it can be done. So the thing is, without really throwing the spotlight on, on what they have done or what we have done in psychology, <clears throat> we have decided that the best way not to navigate life necessarily, but to navigate life when it gets difficult or challenging is via 100% diet of pure logic and don't listen to all the other stuff. Obviously, if life wasn't being challenging or difficult or um, really, really painful, then we could sail by in any way we want, wanted to. We could, we'd, 
don't have to be logical if we don't want to. We just sail through it in any old way. It doesn't really matter because there's no challenges. But we seem to be unanimous in this um, viewpoint that when things get tough, that's when we need Mr. Rationality. Hey, Mr. Rationality, we need you again. Like as if he's Superman or something with his underpants worn over his tights. Only instead of S, he's got a big R. Rational, a rational superhero steps in to save us. So this is what we think, that when things get tough, there's only one man for the job, and that is Mr. Super Rationality. So we can understand how, you know, if a bunch of highly intelligent, rational people get together, they could easily come up with this. What else could they come up with, to be honest? But that it isn't the point, of course. The point isn't that we can't understand how anyone could come up with this notion. The point is why we haven't said anything about the, the very plainly obvious fact that it doesn't work. And how do we know it doesn't work? Be because every single one of us that has been um, going through life when it is very, very challenging, stressful, painful, difficult, knows that the rational roadmap doesn't work. I wouldn't, maybe I shouldn't say every single one of us, because some of us might have the impression that it does work, but on the whole, there would be a consensus that nobody it really doesn't cut the mustard don't come and don't come along telling me all that stuff because it's no good it absolutely is no good it's a joke it'll fall to pieces um on the first rainy day but somehow we don't seem to be able to accept the possibility that maybe rationality doesn't work it's rationality or nothing it's um like Abraham Maslow's carpenter, whose only tool is a hammer. So he gets to use that hammer a lot. So we can think of rationality, or we can think of the rational mind as being a sat-nav. So this sat-nav, <clears throat> or Google Maps, we could think of it as being Google Maps just keeps telling us what to do. Okay, the next junction, turn left. When this happens, don't do that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what sat navs do. That's what the rational mind does. It comes out with um, clear cut descriptions of what to do and what not to do, and also of how to do the things that we are to do. So what could be better than that? that obviously, that's really reassuring. And if I'm lost and I've got Google, Map, Google Maps, that's, that is reassuring because this nice voice is going to come and tell me what to do. But we're assuming in the world of everything, not just the world of driving around on streets in a car and getting lost, but everything is the same situation and that it is possible to have a calm, logical, reassuring voice telling us what to do. Well, now you have to do that then do that and then do the homework to make sure you did it right or that you understood it right yes you're doing well this whole idea that there's a program that we can get with it get with a program and then we when we do that we will be okay and if we don't it's not the program's fault of course and the, this always has to be triple underlined it's yours because the program's right the program is always right the method is right the, um, the therapeutic protocol is always right so if it's not working, it's it's you to, uh, to blame. That That is um, the important part of the whole deal, really. That's why it's triple underlined, just so that, you know, we can understand that. Not that anyone's going to say that, but you can feel it. You really can feel it. And if anyone has ever been through a course like that, one of these kind of modern courses, in which therapy has been turned into this rational, this kind of 
r rational old kind of um, thrown together collection of things to do and then you do this and then you do that it's kind of like a recipe and it's all about doing the things often they're about um, self-calming or stress relieving or right? emotion regulation or things like that just technical things we do that's going to help us and I talk to a lot of people that have said afterwards that this kind of I mean it's 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 very very common that people say this that the whole thing is a kind of a double bind in that if it doesn't work it's still your fault so if you don't do it don't embark upon the therapy it's your fault because you're deliberately not you know you're deliberately not participating in your own recovery or wellness if you do it and it doesn't work then it's also your fault because it can't be the um, protocol's fault so then there's a double dose of guilt <clears throat> another layer of guilt unless we happen to be very clear at seeing what's going on and we're not usually very clear at what's seeing what's going on because we're we're trusting creatures and we tend to trust in the authority that's around us which in this case is not a good thing because the exclusively rational approach to life diffi life's difficulties can never work we need more than logic to get through life's great difficulties which are part of life it's life showing its difficult side but it's still life and so to either get through life or to get through life's challenges we've got to we've got to have more than just logic logic just ain't gonna ain't gonna do it at all which i know i keep saying one way to argue this is to go through a really difficult experience yourself and just learn that way and i guess most of us probably will maybe all of us will i don't know is it possible to live life without being challenged and if so maybe that's the worst challenge of all but most of us when we go through a difficult time we, we know we we didn't do it by suddenly divorcing ourselves from all our other faculties and becoming exclusively logical about it something else came to our aid every single human being going back thousands and thousands of years will say something came to my rescue and it wasn't me i didn't come to my rescue i here i am coming to my rescue i'm going to I'm going to self-soothe. I'm going to, which sounds oh, it sounds really weird. I'm going to regulate my anger, my emotions, my stress, my anxiety. I'm coming to my rescue. Now that is what the alchemists call the way of error, the via erratum. No, sir, it's not how it works. We don't come and swoop down and come to our own rescue. Sorry, but it just doesn't work like that. And um, the entire experience of the human race, if we took the trouble to look into, um what people have written or said testifies to that that oh no you can't pull yourself out of that hole by your own shoelaces you just drive yourself mad trying to do so which is what we do in anxiety we've got to figure a way out figure a way out figure a way out and that trying to figure a way out i for me to figure a way to get myself out of the hole is the problem it isn't um something that shows us how to solve the problem it actually is the problem that it's trying to solve it's the way of error the via erratum purposeful logical action it, it might be our battle cry but it's not going to get us out of that dark hole and anyone who's been in that dark hole i would bet money on the fact that they know that or that will that will come and tell us that for nothing we'll just say yes it wasn't logic that got me out of there and there's a kind of a it's almost like if you and someone else has been through that you both know between each other well it sure as hell wasn't logic as the um, the rational kind of psychologist guy might, guys might think in their 
wherever it is they are, their ivory tower. No, it definitely wasn't um, logic. So the thing is that what it is, it's kind of inexplicable. And that devalidates it because we think unless we can logically represent it, what good can it be? Which is the whole argument going around in a circle because logic won't accept anything but logic. So if something is logical, then we dismiss it because logic says, well, it can't be um, can't be logical. That just isn't logical. It isn't right. We can't explain it. We can't do research on it. We can't prove it. So this really brings in a whole... Um, this brings in the whole of our cultural emphasis on provability, measurability, reliability, um, testability, researchability. And at this point in time, we're absolutely mad on that stuff. We're crazed by it. We can't get enough of research tells us, experts tell us, research has shown, experts have discovered that we're continuously hearing really um, what sounds like ground-breaking um, news of this, but none of it means a damn really. None of it comes to anything. It's just a kind of um, it's just clickbait, really. Research say this. Research research proves this. So there's this extraordinary thing where we imagine we're onto a good thing at last. And it's called research and we're not going to be told that this isn't going to be it. Research is it. It's going to solve all our problems, including our mental health problems. And everyone believes this. This, Not everyone believes it, but everyone in a position of um, everyone who's influential within this world of mental health care believes this, as far as I can see. And if they don't believe it, then they should speak up a little bit more to try and um, counterbalance all the rest of them that do believe it. We should be hearing more from the other side. And the other side is that rationality was only ever a small part of life. And the core of it is a totally irrational thing. And there's no rational way to get through it. In other words, life is a mystery. No matter what, how many um, qualifications you might have or under how much research you might have read or performed. Life's still a mystery and it always will be a mystery. We'll never unmystery it. All of our research and our looking for our definite um, and evidence based, which is a hysterical comment. Because as, um, as a number of scientists, physical scientists have said, what's happened here is we've copied the protocols and the general manner of conducting itself from the, the, the physical sciences onto the life sciences and assume that this kind of garb, the, our um, appearance of being rigorous and doing lots of statistical analysis and doing all, all the rest of the, the research stuff is science just because it's the outward appearance of science. But according to, say, Richard Feynman, it isn't. Richard Feynman, generally reckoned to be the greatest physicist of the second half of the 20th century. And he, according to himself, he can't recognise what's going on in the social sciences, which includes psychology, as being in any way science, because it lacks the core thing in science, which is actually having some understanding of the deep principles that, that, that are responsible for the phenomena that we are observing. And um, the research isn't God. And the research doesn't even mean anything unless we do have a very, there's a correlation between our activities and performing research and, and our understanding of deep principles which often seems to come first, I think. Certainly, reading Richard Feynman's um, autobiography, the insight comes first, and the insight does come in the form of um, um, mathematical relationships that can be explained in a certain way. But none of that happens in, in the life sciences. We get an idea, for sure, but we don't get this, this kind of um, 
what what verges upon a mystical insight really which is what all the top physicists would talk about and so when we're doing when we're doing research it's not as if we're doing research on a, a subatomic particle where they're, they're only a kind of a certain number of variables that need to be controlled for human beings there's so many variables that need to be controlled for the whole idea of controlling all those variables is insane there's too many variables and they're very variable variables we don't even know what we're what we're looking at really when we look at a human being because human beings are innately mysterious just as um, life itself is human beings being an expression of life Salam Watts says that um, life shows itself through human beings, or the whole of nature shows itself through human beings, the whole of the whole universe, and um, the cosmic event of the Big Bang shows itself through human beings. We're not trivial. We're not something that can be understood, and um, just like we might understand other processes in life, simpler processes in life. But rather than Rather than say, yeah, this is a mystery and acknowledge the mystery, we choose to take upon ourselves this kind of a bluff and pretending to be scientific and then no one can dare question us. Because, oh, well, he said the R word, the research word. Research doesn't really have that much of a role to play in psychology. Um, according to Jung anyway, Jung said that if psychology proceeds in the path that it was taking, i.e. limiting itself exclusively to what can be clinically proven, proven in laboratories via clinical research, then it will become ever more trivial until in the end it becomes so trivial it's not saying anything about anything. And the reason it becomes trivial is because as I was saying, all the really interesting stuff can't be measured. So we go and t obsess over the uninteresting stuff as that, uh, instead, because at least we can measure it. That's our logic. And it clearly is our logic, because what the hell else would we, would, we be, would we be wasting our time in this way for? We're unconsciously trying to prove that everything is rational and understandable without even knowing what it is that's driving us to try and prove this. So fine psychologists we are, the whole of our efforts are being controlled by an unconscious motivation, an unconscious fear, and yet out of us unconsciously obeying this unconscious fear, we hope to produce something, we hope to produce a glorious science, we hope to arrive at um, deep principles that will shed light on what's going on here. Okay, thanks for watching.